a good morning everyone uh, welcome to this uh, virtual meeting and access to uh, medicine that uh, we are going to have for one hour and a half hopefully uh, we have uh, our panelists ready and we have uh, participants who are joining still joining but we should start and the rest will uh, join on the way other participants will find us uh, along the way you're very welcome we appreciate that this is a festive season and uh, most of you are already preparing to either travel to the village or close down uh, offices but we appreciate that you've made time to be here and have this conversation which is a very important conversation um, the, the purpose of the meeting is to identify opportunities and strategies that promote local production and um, access to medicine amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so we'll have a, a panel of uh, very uh, experienced uh, professionals uh, today who will be speaking to this subject uh, in different aspects, addressing the opportunities and the challenges that we have. Uh, and, and our focus will be uh, on local production, local manufacturing and uh, vaccine equity and promoting access to medicine. We have uh, a panel of uh, five. Uh, we have our keynote speaker, who is uh, Dr. Okuna Neville. I will speak about the, the panelists later in detail to give their profile. Uh, but in brief, we have uh, Dr. Neville, who is the commissioner, um, pharmacy division at Ministry of Health, who is with us today, and she's going to give us a keynote. We also have uh, Dr. Fred Sebisubi, who is uh, our board member, formerly working with Ministry of Health, and he will give us opening remarks to set us off. We have Dr. Dennis Chibira, who is the Executive Director of uh, HEPS, and we have um, our very own Executive Director of uh, SEHAD, Mr. Moses Mulumba, who will also be part of the panel. And we have uh, Ms. Alice Kayongo, who is the Senior Policy, Advi Policy Advisor of uh, WAKI. She will also be part of the panel today. And we have uh, Mr. Nazim Mohammed, who is an, uh, an international uh, pharmaceutical consultant. And he will be bringing us the, as the aspect of the pharmacy and, and uh, regional uh, level. So we have very experienced people, experts in the room, and we are looking forward to a very uh, fruitful discussion um, as we set this off. I would uh, take this opportunity to now invite uh, our uh, Dr. Fred Sevisubi, our board member, who will give us the opening remarks, and thereafter we will go uh, in according with the agenda. Grace will be sharing uh, the agenda as uh, we start. Thank you again for making the time to be part of this. Dr. Sebisubi, over to you. Hello. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, dear participants. Good morning. Yeah, I'm Dr. Service with Fred. I'm a board member of uh, Sehan, but uh, formerly um, I'm currently retired uh, as a commissioner, formerly at the Ministry of Health, the Department of Pharmaceuticals and Natural Medicines. And uh, I want to welcome you all to uh, this uh, very important meeting on the topic opportunities and uh, challenges that uh, COVID-19 has brought, has presented to local production and access to vaccines and, uh, and medicines. Uh, today's meeting has brought on board key stakeholders from uh, the policy body, Ministry of Health and others, regulatory, national drug authorities, civil society organizations, um, who are key in uh, ensuring that uh, uh, medicines are available and accessed in this country. Um, we all know that um, currently in Uganda, there is no um, uh, local manufacturer for human vaccines. 
And of course, uh, we know that there is also a pocket of uh, uh, manufacturers of uh, the Shaman medicines in the country. And we also know that this has always been uh, access and availability of medicines has always been uh, a challenge, okay, to, in this country. And uh, of course, uh, we know that uh, almost like over 80% of the medicines used in this country uh, are imported, leaving only about 10-15% uh, being uh, manufactured locally. So the issue of COVID-19, uh, the challenges that it brings on board certainly is a bigger uh, challenge so that it hampers the it lengthens the um, the pipeline for availability of these medicines and of course uh, impacting on availability and access to these medicines. Of course, we know that COVID-19 has brought a number of challenges like the shortage of uh, human resource working in these industries, but also the uh, economic uh, uh, impact it has brought uh, across the entire uh, world. So this meeting therefore is timely to, uh, to discuss some of these uh, challenges that COVID-19 has brought on board and how they can be, uh, they can be overcome. But also, we also have to look at the uh, available opportunities that this, see, um, this, um, uh, this challenge has, uh, has brought. Okay, so this meeting I think is very important that uh, we shall look at all those challenges, but also the opportunities that uh, this uh, COVID-19 has brought in terms of uh, uh, improving and uh, looking at uh, increased access to these medicines. Of course, we know some of the policies have been uh, uh, manipulated, okay, in some various parts of the country, and of course, it must affect the, the least developed countries. So I want to thank Sehan, first of all, for uh, organizing uh, this meeting together with the HEPs. And I think uh, this is one of its kind, and I think it won't be the last meeting. Okay, that uh, Sehad will be organizing, and they want to uh, thank Sehad for really fighting for improved health rights in this in this country. Um, but also, I think a number of meetings will follow on after this meeting to ensure that uh, uh, we increase the uh, we we'll look at increased availability and access to uh, medicines and uh, vaccines in this country. So I wish to thank all of you, members, participants, panelists who have accepted to join this meeting. And I hope uh, the outcome of this meeting will greatly impact the availability and uh, improve the uh, access to medicines and uh, improve the healthy service delivery in this country. So with those few remarks, I want to once again, thank you all for sparing the time and uh, wish you a very fruitful meeting and uh, happy Christmas because we're nearing that. And of course, uh, we hope we shall end the, the year and enter the new year uh, less of COVID. So thank you very much and uh, most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tebisubi. Um, for those uh, remarks, that's um, let us off and to the meeting and again welcome everyone who has just joined into uh, the meeting we will now um, uh, go to our keynote who um, is dr neville oteba dr neville is the current commissioner of uh, pharmaceutical and natural medicines at uh, ministry of health she holds an mba from SME and uh, um, uh, master's in uh, science pharmaceutical from Havana University, Cuba, and also a uh, master's in science medicines, regulation and control from University of Bradford, UK, with uh, 31 years of work experience. And she is in a uh, recent past been the registrar of pharmacy and the secretary to the pharmacy board, where she worked for 18 years. 
She worked in Mulago National Referral Hospital as a principal pharmacist for five years and the former central medical stores. And now she has been working with Ministry of Health for the last two years as an, um, and also uh, been, she's happily married to uh, a member of the pharmaceutical society. So she brings in a lot of experience both from herself and from the, uh, her partner. We, we want to welcome you to give us a keynote. Um, the remarks, the opening remarks, Dr. Fred uh, mentioned that we import over 70% uh, of our medicines. And today we want to look at how can we change that? How can we change those uh, percentages? Where are the opportunities for us to change that, that we are able to promote our local manufacturing, you know, pharmaceutical production? So over to you, Dr. Nezio. Uh, thank you very much, Anne and colleagues who are on. I take in before. So I think it is good for us to 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 give thanks to God for bringing us this far. So I will start with a word of prayer, loving Master. We want to thank you that you have brought us here to discuss issues of national importance. Father, we don't take it for granted. We know that it is the right time and the right topic. King of glory, those who are supposed to join us, may you please hasten their best so that they are able to come and contribute to this important topic. We pray all this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I hope you're hearing me. Can you? Yes, we can. We can hear you. Okay, fine. Uh, I will deliberate on this topic. Uh, COVID has been a topic of almost two years now, and it is only important that we also contribute to issues of national importance. I thank the team for choosing the topic and that. There is no colleague, Dr. Fred, for the opportunity to bring warm greetings from the challenges that COVID-19 presents or is still presenting. And I may not do much about the challenge. We need to take into consideration that as COVID presents a lot of opportunities that we cannot talk about, we cannot live without talking of, is the issue of we lost loved ones. That is a challenge that we live with us. Systems were overwhelmed right from the Ministry of Finance. We had needs that needed to be met. The national resource envelope, as you know, is fixed somehow. But we are grateful that Ministry of Finance had to repurpose. So one of the challenges that uh, came with COVID is the need to repurpose, the need to divert from the original plan at all levels, even at the household level. Because if you have the whole family getting COVID and there is no breadwinner, the breadwinner is down and in isolation in Namboli, the son is isolated in a mulago. The mother is isolated in a school somewhere. It, it is really, it was a big challenge. 
that we may we, we, we will live we will live with forever. Then there are issues at the pharmaceutical level because of the, the overwhelming need, the demand, the logistical demand. Even pharmaceutical manufacturers had to repurpose, some of them had to divert the line, leave what they were doing and to rush and see how they can meet the demand for COVID supplies. Because the COVID supplies kept on increasing. We started with the mask. Then along the way, we need the dexamethasone. Then along the way, we need the zithro in plenty. Then along the way, uh -uh, hydro hydroxychloroquine can no longer be used. We had to leave, but at a very high cost. The medicines we have bought, brought, distributed, then the case management team by advising, it is it can no longer be used. Put yourself in, in, in that shoes. You have spent money and the medicine cannot be used, neither can it be repurposed. We try to repurpose it, it could not. So one of the biggest challenges that COVID presented is ever-changing demand. So at the ministry, we were able to come up with a national guideline, which we tried to follow. But of course, every other day, something new is coming. The scientists were advising otherwise. So I think this challenge uh, ramificated up to back to our, local, our, our manufacturers, whether local or international. At international level, they were overwhelmed with the demand. This country wants, this country wants, the other one wants. Take, for example, India, even and China. They had to, they had to save their people first. That brings us to the challenge of limited access, inavailability. In that case, the goal and the purpose of the national medicines policy, we are affected grossly because we are supposed to provide affordable, accessible, safe, and all that medicine. During COVID, it was something else. We tried to adhere, but of course, we saw products coming, recommended for use in the COVID treatment, especially in the HDUs, high dependent units, and intensive care units. And that also posed a challenge to the existing system because NDA has got a protocol of how medicines are supposed to be registered and used in Uganda. With the COVID, as a public health emergency, we had to act very fast to ensure that any medicine which is claimed to be useful is brought to Uganda. So that brings in the, the, the challenge of safety. Some of the medicines had gone over phase one, phase two clinical trials, but some phases were still incomplete. But because of the high demand, because there's a global mechanism of ensuring that such medicines are used in public health emergencies with minimal side effects. So that one brought in the challenge that WHO had to work around the clock to make sure that any medicine that is claimed can be used in COVID-19 
I think you've muted yourself. That's an if we can't hear you. Please unmute yourself. So the challenge is still continuing for the government for, 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 for government. Sorry, I'm using my phone. I, I, I received a call which disorganized my network. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. So uh, logistically, there were very many challenges. We have guidelines on how to manage public health emergencies. Of course, the lessons were drawn from Ebola. The issues that with Ebola, Ebola was uh, in, in specific districts, but now with the COVID, it was almost in every district. So prepositioning became a problem because first of all, the stocks which we were having could not be divided for districts to keep, to store, and then the hospitals. So inadequate stock became a big problem associated with funding. Now, when we talk about COVID vaccine specifically, it's a unique Product, yes, we have been managing vaccines all along. The vaccines for routine vaccination. Now, COVID was a special vaccine that came in at the height of COVID 19 after it had killed so many, many patients. And so every country was scrambling to make sure they meet a critical mass to slow down COVID-19 infection spread. And as Fred said, over 90% of the medicines are imported. So here is a country landlocked, the population in their need of vaccines we don't have our local manufacturer whereby maybe you say, no, 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 you're not, you not exporting. Let's first give Ugandans. So that I was queuing up. I really thank the Ministry of Health that moved very fast to secure the 7,000 doses. I think they deserve a hand clap. Can I hear a hand clap, please? It was not easy because every other country wanted. But amidst all the cavalry, we were able to bring that to the country. So the challenge which it posed now to us, the policymakers, is to start thinking outside the how can we remember when there was lockdown, nothing was coming into Uganda, and this is a country 90% 90, 90 dependent on medicines from outside. So this one has helped us to rethink our destiny. How can we be self-sufficient in some of these essential medicines and health supplies, including vaccines? So when the 7,000 doses came, another challenge was the, 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 the associated syringes. So here we are lining up for vaccines and we have to line up for the syringes. Syringes of all things, can't we make syringes in Uganda? So it is a challenge and it provoked thinking of how to solve that, how to solve that problem. Issues to do with the human resources. Our health workers worked for goodness sake. Some were working 72 hours and had work in the ICU units. 
and ordinarily they're supposed to work for eight hours and then other people come in. For some, for some units, it was not possible because the person who is supposed to come and relieve you may, is down in isolation. We also lost some staff, medical workers, all that created the gaps that made, that made health workers to overwork. The epidemiologists got overworked. So that, those are challenges that we need now to plan ahead of time. How can we create a critical mass to alleviate that situation? Then the issues to do with the politicization. We also had our local politics. When COVID first came in, you people also had the position we are thinking, oh, this is a government ploy to, 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 to use resources. And therefore, it took them time to appreciate that there was a problem that needed immediate action. That one aside, the issues of perception of the community that is being protected. So many myths, there was so many myths around COVID and the vaccines, the, 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 the myth is still going on. And up to now, some people do not even have the courage to take the vaccine. So the challenge of passing the right message, you know, an effective communication whereby I tell you what I have told you and you understand it the way I want you to understand it. That communication has not been there. A lot of communication devices, material, what, what has been moving around. But there has been no time to assess whether effective communication is taking place. A case in point. How people were misusing azithromycin for self-medication, concoction of ginger and all, all manners of concoction. All that arose from ineffective communication. So we need to avert that. Back to vaccines. We know very well what vaccine is supposed to do. We tried to explain to our people, but some did not understand it. So it is incumbent upon government to make sure that everyone understands and participates in the vaccination. Remember when we were quantifying for, for the vaccine, we were using the UBOS figure of how many, how many adults, how many children of this age. So now if people do not turn up and their vaccination share is there, it becomes a loss to government. So those are challenges. What, what, what are the opportunities that we can, we can pick on very quickly? Local manufacturers were able, the sharp ones were able to re-strategize and start manufacturing commodities for COVID-19 response, the mask, the seals, the, the the gum boots, the, the aprons, and over 50 companies benefited from this. I think that was an opportunity. Local manufacturers are still manufacturing up to today. That is a tick. National Drug Authority was able to put in place a system 
for quick assessment of these local manufacturers and approval of their products, which, were, which, which was being fast-tracked quickly. That was a tick and is. And because of that, colleagues, so many companies out there are rushing to Uganda to look for where they can set up local manufacturing units. Some we are assessing them, and I know more are yet to come. So that is an opportunity for investment. Along that line, line ministries that are associated with pharmaceutical, local pharmaceutical manufacturing, also started up. In fact, I want to applaud Uganda Investment Authority, Uganda Environmental, I don't know that ministry, because they have to do the environmental assessment within record time and submit to the Ministry of Health. Uganda Investment Authority has been quick in giving their certificate. You both, Uganda National Standards Bureau, every line ministry and MDAs had to, to up their game to make us reach where we are, which is an opportunity. Above all, it has created an opportunity for Ugandans to make their products and claim intellectual property rights over them, which is a good thing and should be promoted. Now, when it comes to vaccines, especially COVID-19 vaccine. A lot of work is being done behind the scene and they can only come out when the food is ready. It is of research nature. It takes time, but the work is ongoing. We are also receiving requests I don't know if we've lost you. We can't hear you, Dr. Nzio. Either you've muted yourself again, or, but we hope you're summarizing as we uh, want to catch up with time with the next panelist. If you're hearing us, please unmute yourself. We can't hear you now. And, and... I think she has dropped off the call. Mm, I don't know. Uh, we might have to go to the to the next uh, panelist, and we and she will uh, summer. She'll have time at the end of the panel discussion to wrap up her since she hadn't yet um, wrapped up. So we'll um, as she. Uh, tries to get back and Grace will help to get her uh, to get her back on on the call. We will go into the panel discussion. Oh, I see she's back. Dr. Neville, are you able to just summarize in uh, two minutes? Just to summarize, and we go into the panel discussion. Yes, she still can't hear us. So we will uh, have a panel discussion. Thank you again, Dr. Neville. We will invite. Sorry, you. Anne. Yes, Anne. I'm I'm okay. going to wind up. Okay. Sorry, I received a call from my director and it disrupted a bit, but I'm done with it now. Let me just summarize. I was saying 
the, the local manufacturing of vaccine is a blue ocean. It is an area that we can interest investors to, to look into because it is the way to go, but it is capital intensive. I want to say that the environment for supporting local manufacturing of vaccines exists, as you have seen from, from the commitment of our president, His Excellency Kaguta Mutseveni. So those who want to come should come and start uh, manufacturing vaccines. We are going to give them all the support. All the, the supporting ministries are ready. We have the energy, we have uh, the NITA U, the Uganda Communications, and all those ministries and MDAs and NDA, we are ready to support them. And also, lastly, to say that the National Development Plan of Uganda emphasizes on local manufacturing and we are fast tracking it and it forms a very big basis for production of vaccines. But it, along the way, we need also human resources to participate in, in, in the manufacturing of vaccines. The challenge which goes with vaccines also was the issue of, of storage temperatures. So we encourage local manufacturing of vaccines, but of vaccines that can be easily stored, not the one which is supposed to be stored in minus what degrees, which is very, very difficult. And the only uh, facility that can store that is national medical stores. With the guidelines, we are working on, on guidelines for managing COVID medicines and for public health emergencies, what we call medicines countermeasures plan. We are finalizing it and all this will provide a supportive environment for local manufacturing. The other opportunity which we got colleagues, we have been breathing free air. Little did we know that that air is very expensive. So when issues of oxygen came up, definitely we could not stand on our ground. But I'm happy to note that as we talk now, we need over 7,000 oxygen cylinders. And because of COVID, we have managed to procure over 3,000. And because of COVID, the oxygen plants in the regional referral hospitals are being refurbished to manufacture oxygen within the hospital. And lastly, Uganda is exploring a possibility of manufacturing liquid oxygen. With those very few words, I want to thank you very much for listening and for giving me an opportunity to talk to the people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Panaziu, for sharing with us and highlighting those challenges um, as well as opportunities. Uh, I think to take away beyond the challenges that you have shared around uh, repurposing and the resource, um, uh, the resource, the strain of COVID on the resources, government resources, and the logistical challenges, and also diversion in terms of uh, focus for the manufacturers. We really appreciate that uh, you shared with us those opportunities, especially highlighting the commitment and uh, the will uh, of government to support uh, local manufacturers, uh, and also fact that other people are coming to invest into uh, local manufacturing because this uh, particular meeting we are focusing on that uh, local manufacturing how do we uh, support and promote and what are the opportunities around that so we thank you and uh, i've seen a uh, lot of uh, uh, people in the in the on the call uh, from different 
um, fields. So I'm seeing people from the academia, civil society, and uh, uh, doctors, and so forth. So as we go along, as we have the discussion, I know that some issues uh, keep coming up. Please share um, your uh, views uh, on the and questions on the Q&A, which is available, where you find uh, uh, those tagging issues as the panelists discuss. Um, we're going into a panel discussion, and the, our first panelist is our very own executive director, Mr. Mnumba Moses, who is the executive director of SEHAD, Center for Health, Human Rights, and Development. He's a senior lawyer uh, with special interest in international human rights and global health and sexual reproductive health. He is, uh, also has widely researched and published and taught in various areas, and he's an IP expert, intellectual property expert. He, um, has been an African advisor to HIV, um, to the HIV and the Law Commission, uh, and the former board of the uh, NDA. And uh, he has been a principal investigator in research around uh, utilizing treaty flexibility to promote access to medicine. So he has a lot of wealth uh, to share with us in terms of the opportunities that we have. Uh, so well, uh, over to you, Mr. Mnumba, to take us. Thank you so much, Anne, and uh, I thank our keynote uh, 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 speaker and the rest of the panelists that will be speaking later on. So, and my understanding is that I have a bit of 10 minutes to uh, share my own thoughts in terms of uh, policy interventions that have to uh, happen um, for local manufacturing to, to be happening. So, I I'm quite happy that we are having this conversation because over the last three years, I think it's been demonstrated that without local pharmaceutical manufacturing, we are going to stay beggars for a very long time. And this is a song we've been singing for the last 15 years when we have looked at um, laws. Um, and for the very first time, I think things like intellectual property laws, which are policy in nature, uh, making sense. But I will not just focus on that. I think one of the most illuminating exercises that have been part of um, where I was uh, with Dennis and a few other colleagues in 2013, we undertook an assessment of uh, our own local manufacturing. And uh, I'm happy that some of the participants during that assessment are still part of the conversations that uh, we are talking about. And I don't think that things have changed much um, since then. What is clear for me is that medicines continue to be very important um, as life-saving, as preventative therapies, but also um, as a tradable good. So they are also not just consumables, but as a factor that we need to pick interest in as a country um, that participates in, in trade. Unfortunately, very many people um, continue to face challenges in accessing affordable quality medicines. And a few years back, we had a whole campaign on substandard medicines and counterfeit medicines and, and the number of challenges that come with that. Of course, it came with its confusion, but the issues of quality continue to be very paramount um, on medicines. What is still very important is that right from um, the Almata Declaration, I think there is a recognition that local pharmaceutical production is important in a long term. So in a short term, we may enjoy um, importation and at the time we did the assessment, I don't think the situation has changed much. Close to 80% of our medicines were imported. And people were arguing that when you manufacture medicines here, it's very expensive. So it's better that we rely on importation. But I think what COVID has demonstrated is that the moment you rely on, on importation, sustainability um, becomes a huge challenge. This is not just for Uganda. I think across the board uh, within the sub-Saharan region, averagely, we only produce about 30% of the medicines that we need. Now, 30% is the highest producer in the region, and that could be like South Africa. But we also have situations where people manufacture 5% or 10% um, of the medicines that they need um, locally. 
And this is leading to a number of issues um, that I think we need to think about much more critically than we have ever thought about them. Very interestingly, at a regional level, and I know that uh, my colleague Nazim will be speaking about this, the East African community picked a lot of interest in the agenda on local pharmaceutical manufacturing. I was part of a number of consultancies and studies which led to you know, the, man, the, the development of the regional manufacturing plans of action. I think we had one in 2012 that ended in 2016 and later on we had it renewed and, and it's ongoing now. But we also had initiatives around medicines registration harmonization. We have the East African industrialization policy and, and strategy. And then the one that I was very passionate about was the TRIPS protocol, which was supposed to help us understand the flexibilities within the TRIPS agreement that would enable us to do uh, local pharmaceutical manufacturing. I think that what one observes is that we are not out of policies, be it at a regional, be it at a national level. But I, the actualization of these policies to spark local pharmaceutical manufacturing is still a huge gap that we have. Um, and, and this is something that we need to, to deal with. And when I talk about policies, I think it's policies about the different stakeholders, the different sectors, um, policies around production of, of medicines, um, policies around research and development on, on medicines, uh, issues like pharma, pharmacovigilance, issues like marketing of medicines and pricing all become very important policy areas. So it is very difficult for one to argue that one single policy is going to be sufficient to trigger local pharmaceutical manufacturing. If one is to look at policies, we certainly have to look at the entire spectrum of policies that impact on, on local manufacturing. I think Uganda as a case study is very interesting because within the East African community, we are second to Kenya. Um, Kenya being the largest pharmaceutical manufacturer, Uganda comes second, and, and then um, we get Tanzania, Rwanda, um, Burundi, and then the rest of the countries that come in. Being number two within the East African community, I think is something that is worth celebration, but we need to ask so many questions. Um, how do we reach here? And, and what are those things that we need to, to get into? We've been celebrated because of manufacturers like Quality Chemicals um, that have obtained the WHO pre-qualification. At some time, it was sung as uh, one of the biggest achievements within the continent. And, and it still is because I think we've been able to manufacture some medicines that we have locally, but also we are looked at as exporters of medicines. We take medicines to Namibia and, and medicines to, to Zambia. But I think one manufacturing plant is not sufficient for us to be proud as uh, people having local um, pharmaceutical manufacturing. If we only fund almost 30% of our essential medicine supplies um, locally um, from the national budget. It means that um, even the financing itself becomes a challenge. And once financing from the national budget is not assured to local manufacturers, then incentivizing them in terms of uh, having them as manufacturers, it, it, it becomes a, um, a bit of a challenge. So let me focus a bit on a number of challenges that we've seen over the years that I think would be very important to deal with as we talk about local um, pharmaceutical manufacturing. First, the heavy reliance on importation um, on even key important things for local manufacturing like active pharmaceutical ingredients is continuously keeping us low and down. We rely a lot on China, we rely a lot on India, Brazil, to have active pharmaceutical ingredients. Now, COVID-19 indicated to us that if we cannot have our own local uh, materials uh, that are important for manufacturing, then we are still lagging behind in terms of uh, seeing manufacturing. I have seen um, in situations where even the government has come up and it has tried to promote local pharmaceutical manufacturers, but its own policies are unclear. So. A few years ago, we went and did interviews. It was very clear that quality chemicals had benefited a lot in, in, in the government support. They received land, tax holidays, and, and a couple of other things. And I even remember a time when we had the global fund crisis, when a size of the national budget was cut and it was given to quality chemicals to be able to manufacture ARFs. That was a major boost. We don't see this in other pharmaceutical industries. What's the qualification? for an industry to benefit from such. 
I know that in the interviews we did before, Abacus Pharmaceuticals, um, Abacus Parentals uh, then um, had applied for land from the Uganda Investment Authority. They couldn't get the land in the industrial park in Lozira um, that Kwaite Chemicals had got. They had to go to Mukona and buy their own land. So those considerations that are unclear, that are selective in nature, I think become very difficult for us to promote um, local pharmaceutical manufacturing. We also have a very unclear market for local manufacturing uh, manufacturers. You see, once local manufacturers have manufactured, they would want their products to go out. And I remember farms um, that indicated that they can produce 100% um, of what we need within the East African community, but we couldn't consume it. And we don't have that constant assessment of our own local market. Because if we assess the local market for local pharmaceuticals, it would help the investors to appreciate that this is a very good market that we get into. And, and therefore uh, have people um, coming into the market. Because of some of these, uncompetitiveness in our costs of production is becoming a big issue. We import everything. Um, um, the container in, in, in China, we, to get a container in China, it is much cheaper to have it from China to Mombasa, but to get it from Mombasa all the way to Kampala is almost twice the price now. Um, those disadvantages that we continue to have and without particular policy interventions on things like pharmaceuticals um, make it very difficult. We import things, not just active pharmaceutical ingredients, but also packaging materials, which are very, very expensive. So when our competitiveness is low, it certainly makes things um, quite um, difficult. When the market is undetermined, it makes things quite difficult. We also had a couple of things with the National Drug Authority. While it regulates production, importation, and supply of medicines in the country, I think when it comes to manufacturing, the capacities of National Drug Authority still need to be made much better. We found out that drug manufacturing of these plants would be once in a year. Sometimes it takes once in three years. Now, the purpose of a drug regulated authority is to support partly the local manufacturing plants to be able to be compliant, but also compete globally. So if you do not have these inspections that are supportive to the manufacturers, it becomes very difficult. Even when NDA would come into some of the pharmaceutical industry, it would be like a police. So coming to police without giving the necessary support, that, that sort of um, also turned into a challenge. Many pharmaceutical industries globalize benefit a lot in their associations. And these associations are very important. So the Uganda Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, for instance, would be a first recon way a negotiator for these benefits would be the force that the pharmaceutical industries actually use. But it was very disheartening to find out that very few pharmaceutical industries uh, were part of the Uganda Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association. So if we cannot be able to get all the pharmaceutical manufacturers in one association, things become difficult. This, this sounds like internal more, but I think it certainly impacts on the local manufacturing that we would want to see that takes us to the manufacturing of, uh, um, of medicines. The lack of investment in research and development continues to be a big thing. <laughs> Out of the pharmaceutical industries that we saw, I think there was only one, which was quality chemicals that had established a research and development division. Now, this was also at its impasse then. I'm not sure how much it has advanced since then. You find that the, the collaborations that would be happening between universities and these pharmaceutical industries is very low and very slow. The, the, the manufacturers actually find it easier to collaborate with universities outside Uganda than the universities in Uganda. And, and lack of that collaboration becomes a, a big challenge in terms of having sufficient human resources that would uh, uh, take things forward. So by summary, I think, if one looked at policies, um, there are things that we need to learn from the region. Ghana, I think right in 1989, um, imposed restrictions on pharmaceutical um, importations. And this has helped Ghana to, to, to really develop. And it would be one of the things that we need to, to look at and think about. I think regional mobilization is extremely important. Um, the, we have a fierce market from China, India, and Pakistan. If we do not 
actually mobilize and make the East African community as a single market for local pharma pharmaceuticals. It's a big problem. When I see Kenya chasing away agricultural products of, of Uganda, I think about the entire trade policy and how we can be able to grow a market that is bigger, that is competitive, when at a country bilateral level, we cannot be able to, to do things better. We must aggressively promote local pharmaceutical manufacturing with a clear policy. The yardstick must be defined. People should know what they have to be uh, doing to be able to be uh, beneficiaries in local pharmaceutical manufacturing. Affordable financing is a big issue. I have a colleague who has been setting up a, a plant and the pain he has gone through to finance um, the setting up of a plant is unimaginable. Now, in other countries, you receive support beyond tax holidays, um, actual support in terms of accessing affordable finance, but our bank interests uh, with COVID-19 now, it's very fierce to, to be able to get into um, financing uh, of that nature, and it becomes a challenge. I will never forget a situation where one pharma pharmaceutical company had to leave the manufacturing of medicines to, to resort to manufacturing biscuits and quencher because it was more profitable then. Part of the investments in local manufacturing, I think for me has to be, come from the side of government because it's not a very profitable company in a short uh, venture in a short run, but it's something that we need to look into much more closely. I'll stop there for now and look forward to questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rumba, for highlighting those uh, both challenges around policies and uh, proposing some of the recommendations that we can do around uh, improving and moving ahead with the policies. Uh, we have uh, if, uh, you've uh, proposed some like learning from the region around uh, policies and being clear on um, the incentives that we give to local manufacturers. Uh, to encourage that production, uh, among other things. We would now want to uh, go into the next panelist to uh, add on that um, discussion, again, in terms of the opportunities, the challenges that we see uh, um, around local manufacturing. So we have our next panelist, who is um, Dr. Dennis Chibira, who is the Executive Director of uh, HEPS. And he is a pharmacist, a researcher, and he has uh, extensive experience in public health system, pharmaceutical policy, research and advocacy, uh, both at regional and global level. And he also holds uh, a PhD in pharmaceutical policy and regulation at the WHO Collaborating Center for Pharmaceutical Policy and Regulation at Uttarak University. You're very welcome to share with us your views um, on the subject. Thank you, Anne, and uh, thank you for this very uh, in, important meeting. Good morning, colleagues. I'm uh, very delighted to be here talking amidst my seniors, uh, our commissioner, Dr. Neville, our uh, very long serving. Uh, and now retired uh, public servant, uh, Dr. Fred Sebisui, who also happens to still be a co-chair for the Medicines Transparency Alliance, which I coordinate, but also our very own Nazim Mohammed, uh, uh, who has been pushing uh, for local pharmaceutical production, who is a pioneer, in the uh, setting up of the Uganda Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, but also uh, their East African uh, compatriots, and uh, who also is a co-chair for the Medicines Transparency Alliance. So I'm really uh, privileged to uh, just be amidst these people, uh, but also uh, Moses has said almost everything I had to say, and I'll probably just underscore a few things. And maybe if you could allow me to share, I think most of what Moses has said and what I will say is from a report um, that we did some eight years ago. And I'll, I'll just share the, the cover so that we could probably, Sehad could take time and look and do more with this report because it's still as relevant 
now, even more relevant now as, um, as it was um, eight years ago. I will stop my video, but probably I'll speak while sharing um, the cover of this um, report. Which we should all look up and read again because it's still very, very relevant and pertinent. Certainly, COVID 19 has taught us a lot. I think uh, I'll, uh, I'll take a quote from, from Nazim uh, when I called him early last year at the start of this uh, pandemic. And uh, he had just ordered uh, raw materials for chloroquine. Um, from China, and within a few months, the, the raw material was not available because COVID had, had come, and hydrochloroquine was being used to uh, um, uh, to treat COVID, and uh, the price had multiplied by twenty times from uh, a few months when he had made the order. But even then, the product was not available. We've seen that supply chains have continued to still be disrupted. And we see the hoarding of commodities by bigger countries. The global inequity we now see in, a, in the vaccine distribution. All this really goes to show that we need to think more about ourselves. Uh, we need to reduce this reliance on uh, uh, external support for our um, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing, and we need to invest more. Um, what are those opportunities and co complexities? I'll just make probably make an addition. But before that, we can clearly see that the global uh, trade system, which we have continuously relied on, is not, is not going to help us deliver uh, access to medicines for, um, for our country. Uh, and therefore, you see that even with the vaccines that have been manufactured elsewhere by um, the Pfizer's and the Moderna's of this world, we see that a lot of that has had to, pub, there's been a lot of public investment. Their countries have invested a lot. And I think that's where I will start from. If we are able to make pharmaceutical production viable in our country, the government needs to play more than lip service. We, money has to be put. We have uh, a good policy environment, both globally and locally, and we need to take advantage of that. But there is no way we can do that without putting money. Um, one of the key challenges I see uh, personally is that whereas we have uh, different institutions uh, for the pharmaceutical sector and for Ministry of Health in particular, our national health policy, the national medicines policy, the pharmaceutical strategic plan, which has just started off, but also um, the, the recent roadmap, the 10 year roadmap uh, for the health supply chain clearly bring up local pharmaceutical production. The key challenge will be in how this is implemented because investments and adequate investments have to be made. But we also have a number of other institutions. We have the, uh, the National Research Organization, we have the Uganda National Council of Science and Technology, we have the Uganda Investment Authority, we have um, uh, the National Drug Authority. All these institutions play a part. And all of them have a mandate that feeds into local pharmaceutical production. We need to have a forum where they sit and bring, bring together the resources they have to be able to, to push this forward. Otherwise, when you have many of these uh, institutions, 
that have a common mandate, it becomes difficult to harmonize. Uh, we see, uh, um, it's a pity that uh, uh, Professor Huang couldn't join today, but even with these COVID X, you remember that the, the president had to come out and pronounce himself. In how many circumstances will the president be able to come and pronounce himself for support to be provided? We see that this is very rare. It is just the, uh, the same case that uh, uh, Moses has just been talking about of quality chemical industries. Many of the um, pharmaceutical uh, manufacturers were not as privileged enough to be able to get the incentives um, that quality chemicals was able to get. And therefore, it is very important that these different institutions that have a mandate relating to this local production, that they come together, sit together, and agree on a common working framework. But also the incentives that are provided by government should not be incentives whereby uh, it requires someone to talk to the president, it requires someone to know uh, someone. This, there should be a, a framework in which these incentives are provided. Many of the manufacturers we talked to in this uh, uh, report of 2013 felt that the, the tax waivers and the concessions that were there, they were so small to offset the challenges that they faced. I'll continue to emphasize the issue of high production costs. Moses has talked about this, but for as long as we are importing raw materials, for as long as we, are, um, we have to meet the transportation from China to, uh, to the coast in Mombasa is cheaper than transporting from Mombasa to Kampala, it is not, we are not going to make any sense. For as long as we have not, um, let me just continue a little bit on the cost of production. For as long as the cost of energy, the cost of electricity in Uganda is I think third highest, third highest, third or second highest in Africa. And therefore manufacturing elsewhere would be cheaper because once we have, uh, even the electricity is not reliable and people have to use generators, using a generator, generator fuel costs three times as much as this electricity we have said is third most expensive uh, on the African continent. And therefore we need to find ways, how do we improve these other uh, areas that uh, local manufacturing actually relies on. Um, data. You see, at the moment, and I mentioned this at, uh, at, the, um, at the meeting with the pharmaceutical uh, society yesterday, even as of today, we, we can only estimate the value of the pharmaceutical market. We do not know the actual value. And it's, it's estimated based on the donations we receive, based on maybe what we know the government puts, but the private sector also plays a very, very big part. We do not know. And yet National Drug Authority collects all information for all imports. Without data, you cannot, no one is going to come and invest blindly. They need to know how much is the disease burden, how much medicines are consumed, at how much, and therefore they are able to develop a business plan. But right now, a few years ago, the pharmaceutical market was estimated at about 110 US dollars. As of last year, it was estimated at about 430 million US dollars. And this is mainly because uh, I think there's an estimate of uh, what comes in from donations. And as I've said, of course, what contribution government makes. We need to have a comprehensive assessment that, that will help us know the, the, this value so that proper investments can be made. Um, moving on, we need to know, first of all, 
a number of global initiatives, and particularly those that have come around with COVID. The partnership for the African vaccine manufacturing, the African medical supplies platform that is uh, coordinated through UNICEF, the African Union's COVID uh, vaccine development access strategy, the African vaccine COVID vaccine acquisition task force, and the COVID-19 innovations for all. These are initiatives that are happening at the African level. We need to know who is representing us as Uganda in these initiatives. What are they discussing in these initiatives? What is it that we can bring home from these initiatives? If we, we are not part of the discussion, there is no way we are going to be able to benefit when we do not know what's going on. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, recently, uh, I think a month and a half ago, the African Medicines Agency was ratified by the African Union. It received enough votes to, be, to become an agency. We need to know which Ugandan is representing us there. How do we get opportunities for jobs, opportunities to know what's happening in this African Medicines Agency? These are questions that require all of us to, um, to be able to, to sit and participate. More so, I think, let me go back and emphasize the issue of human resource. Many times when we train here, our training is very theoretical. We need to ensure that academia is very closely linked with the manufacturers, that these production units that we have do not have to import experts from abroad to be able to repair simple uh, machines that will break down. How is our education curriculum related to the needs that we have as a country, and in particular, the needs of local production? These are questions that we should be asking. I know very many young students, even here in Makerere and Barara, that are engaged in some form of research. And we see that also Professor Guang's research, and I think Professor uh, uh, Alice in, uh, 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 in Gulu University, with, that actually tells us there's a lot of research happening at universities. How do we harness that more? How do we support these young students that are trying to invent, that are trying to study? That's where production starts. And so uh, I think, uh, I know that uh, Madame Oteba's department is heavily constrained in terms of human resource. There is a lot to do, very few, very few hands. And they have to be everywhere. Like you heard on this call, she had to talk to the director. There is a, an, a pharmaceutical society annual general meeting, which should also be part of. Uh, there are a number of things that are happening, few hands. We need a desk within the Ministry of Health and within the, pharma, the, pharma, uh, the, the pharmacy department that is every day looking out at pharmaceutical production. We need another unit that is just looking at how to implement these different policies that have been uh, put across. That will require that the ministry needs to be resourced. And therefore, we need more political will. I think I've overshot the time I was given. Uh, and uh, maybe, I need to uh, stop here and uh, maybe I will engage more uh, as, we, as we discuss this further. Uh, thank you very much and back to you, uh, Anne. Thank you so much, uh, Dennis.
for sharing that. And I think like all the, um, the speakers before, you highlight um, a real uh, challenge in terms of the investments and um, the capital investment, how uh, heavy it is uh, for the pharmaceutical production and how critical it is for governments to align the incentives uh, to address the complexities around uh, uh, local manufacturing. Um, we will now go into the next session. I know that uh, the, uh, Mr. Mlumba highlighted around uh, regional mobilization and how we can tap into the regional market um, uh, as East Africa. Uh, and also um, somehow it came through also from Dr. Dennis in terms of the opportunities at regional level, uh, with the African Union and the partnership at the African level. So we will go into uh, the discussion with Mr. Nazim Mohammed uh, uh, regarding the regarding the regional uh, opportunities that we have, um, and uh, to introduce uh, Mr. Nazim. He is uh, an in, uh, international pharmaceutical consultant, and he has over 40 years of uh, business experience in the global pharmaceutical sector. And he currently advises different organizations as an international pharmaceutical consultant. He has also served as a, a head of the pharmaceutical sector for industrial promotion and for the um, Aga Khan Development Network, and also was a CEO at the Kampala Pharmaceutical Industries. Um, Mr. Nazim is also a coach and a member of the ICF Uganda chapter, and is very interested to work with entrepreneurs uh, to help them reach their potential. Mr. Nazim, you're very welcome to share with us your perspective and add on to the discussion. Uh, th thank you, Anne. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Anne. Uh, thank you for seeing us, for inviting me. I feel quite honored to be part of this panel. And like uh, Dennis mentioned, and so did Moses, it's very nice to be amongst friends. Uh, we need to keep pushing the agenda of local manufacturing. What I'd like to do is sort of take it up a little bit from uh, Dr. Nehru's presentation, where she mentioned that, particularly in terms of vaccines, there is a lot of things going on in the background. Uh, I'm personally quite involved in some of that. So I'd like to just share with, with the audience uh, a little bit more about vaccines, a bit more than perhaps you may not uh, may know. This pandemic undoubtedly has been a huge wake up developing countries for Africa. We have suddenly realized that even some of the very basic things we don't make, the way important. It's already been touched on, you know, from masks to gowns to gloves. Suddenly we were struggling to find it. You know, not only us, I mean, even in the West, they were struggling because suddenly, you know, people couldn't, there was a shortage of glass. They couldn't make enough vials. They couldn't make, you know, so, so it's been really an eye opener, but I think much more impactful on, on, on particularly Sub Saharan Africa. So, what happened was all our heads of state got together earlier in the year and obviously agreed that, particularly when it comes to vaccines, we need, a, we need an African plan because the, the virus unfortunately doesn't respect borders. As we know, it doesn't matter whether you are a Ugandan or a Kenyan or a South African. It doesn't matter whether you're a Muslim or a Christian or a, or a Jew, it really attacks all of us. So in uh, April, 2021, so April of this year, <clears throat> the African Union set up a organization called PAVM, P-A-V-M, and that stands for Partners of African Vaccine Manufacturing. It's a very large organization uh, consisting of a lot of people, very well governed. And it has been set up purely to achieve the African Union uh, very, very aggressive goal that by 2040, so really only 20 years away, by 2040, Africa should be manufacturing 60% of the vaccines that we use. I would love to ask, you guys, what do you, what you think we manufacture today? It is less than 1%. So we have a goal in Africa to go from less than 1% to 60% of vaccine manufacturing within the next 20 years. So how on earth are we gonna do that, right? So let me, let me just talk to you a little bit about uh, how PAVM is organized. 
But you know, before I go into that, a lot of people don't quite appreciate who are not really involved in it that how complex vaccine manufacturing is. It is completely different from manufacturing the products that we manufacture in East Africa today, which are normal tablets and capsules and, and syrups. Uh, it is totally different from that. I mean, in East Africa today, we have nearly 40 companies that manufacture medicines, as we know them. There are zero companies that manufacture uh, uh, vaccines. In the whole of sub-Saharan Africa, until this uh, COVID uh, pandemic started, there were only two companies, one in South Africa called BioVac, uh, based in Cape Town, and one in Senegal called Institute Pasteur Dhaka that manufactured a yellow fever vaccine. So we only had two companies in the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa which had any vaccine experience. Now, because of a, a, a deal with Johnson & Johnson and Aspen, which is also based in South Africa, we now have three companies. But imagine only three companies compared to over 500 companies in, in Sub-Saharan Africa that manufacture medicine. So keep that in mind, that when we talk about uh, vaccines, it is extremely complex and it is totally different from, from uh, manufacturing uh, normal medicines that we do. So going back to Pavam. So Pavam is basically a, a pan-African uh, organization run and driven by Africa. Okay, so that I think, number one, is a good thing, right? But it has a huge advisory group made up of a lot of uh, vaccine uh, experts from CEPI to Gavi to WHO, the World Trade Organization, uh, to the National Institute of Health from the United States, from Bill and Melinda Gates. So so huge number of people who have expertise in vaccines are, are in the advisory group. Uh, the, the, the secretariat is purely African. Uh, uh, and, and I am very luckily been asked to be one of the advisors to the secretariat. So I've been quite deeply involved in the last six months uh, in, in, into, the, into PAVAM. So PAVAM has organized, they, they identified six critical areas which we need to address very quickly if we are ever to achieve anywhere near the 60% vaccine manufacturing in Africa. So I'll just take you through those six areas and then I'll talk a little bit about the challenges, okay? So first area is what they call market design uh, and demand. So this is about between now and 2040, what will be the need of vaccines in Africa? Right? So we've got to forecast it. As I think both Dennis and Moses both mentioned that one of the things that's lacking, not just in Uganda, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, there is no audit data to say, these are the drugs that we use, these are the drugs that we need. You see, so, so without that, it is almost impossible to forecast uh, what we will need 20 years from now. But, but, but this group has been sitting a lot, uh, driven by McKinsey that are driving the whole process across, uh, across Africa. So they've, they've now come up with a forecast to say, by country, uh, by product, what, how will the, the, the vaccine market develop in Africa over the next 20 years? And if you look at vaccines, there are currently what they call the legacy vaccines, which are the vaccines that we use in our national program. Most of them are pediatric vaccines that we are all aware of. Then there is the, the newer vaccines coming in, like the malaria vaccine, which is about to be launched here. Uh, there, are, there are rotavirus and things like that, which have, haven't been fully utilized in countries. Uh, uh, there are, there's a lot of research going on uh, on new vaccines coming. And then the, the most difficult to forecast is what could be the next pandemic? It, because undoubtedly there'll be one. Hopefully not for a long time, but there'll be one. So this group has now forecasted these vaccines. And from the forecast, they've been working backwards to say, how many companies will we need in Africa to be able to manufacture these vaccines? And currently they are talking about maximum, maximum around 20 companies around Africa. So this is another thing that we all have to understand. Uh, it has become very political. Every head of state wants a vaccine facility in their country. I can tell you right now, they will not get it. Right? because it is just not possible for the reason that I'll come with at the moment. So again, I think uh, it, was, it was both uh, Fred and Dennis were saying, we've got to think of regions. We can't just think of Uganda. We can't think of Kenya. It's got to be East African region at a minimum. Okay? So that was the first. The second stream that we are working on is the regulatory strengthening. 
Why? Because for vaccines, again, it's a completely different way of regulating this product. Uh, and the people who, who know uh, uh, regulatory will, will understand what I'm saying. The, the, the goal is that most NRA is level three, okay? Maturity levels are the way our regulatory agencies are graded according to WHO. Today, our NDA, although it's a very good agency, it is only at ML3, ML1. So it's at maturity level, they know how to do it, but it requires a lot of changing of our laws and things like that. So the regulatory agencies become much more independent. Okay, so that's a challenge. So they're doing this. This stream is looking at what will it require to get us there. Okay, I won't go into a lot of detail because I could really talk about hours of it. The third stream is looking at access to finance. Again, it was brought up that you know our interest rates are so high. Uh, making a just to give you an example, uh, if we want to build a new KPI. Okay, uh, which by the way they're doing now in the Manway. It will take us to, to produce a normal product we produce around 25 to 30 million dollars maximum. Okay, if you want to put up a vaccine facility from start to finish, in other words, from actually making the antigen to fill finish and distributing, you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. Hundreds of millions of dollars. If you were just to do the fill and finish, which is the end process of vaccine manufacturing, which is simply basically taking the vaccine, putting it into vials, even that is about 60, 70 million dollars, which is twice the amount of putting up a new facility for normal medicine. So that's another reason why vaccines become more complicated. The third, uh, so, so basically there's a lot of discussion going on with the African Development Bank, with Africa Exim Bank, with some of the big donors to say, look, if in Africa we need about 20 to 25 vaccine facilities between now and 2040, how are we gonna afford that? Can you give them uh, preferential rates to, 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 so they can borrow not at 25% uh, as it is in Uganda, but at 10%. You know, so, so a lot of that discussion is going on. The third one, which to me is probably one of the most critical for vaccines, is technology transfer and intellectual property uh, sharing, okay? As I've said, vaccine manufacturing is very, very complicated. Uh, it cannot be done without a partner. We just in Africa don't have the expertise. We just have to accept it. We don't have the expertise, okay? It, as I've said many times, it is not like making tablets for Paris people. So we will have to have partners, and that's where governments come in. Uh, uh, you know, governments have to make it, have to incentivize so that the the person who's giving the technology, which is undoubtedly will be a multinational company, you know, the Pfizer's, the BioNTech, the, the Sanofi's, uh, the Johnson & Johnson, uh, these are the, the Moderna. How can we persuade them to come and work with our company with government support to create facilities? As you know, a few things have been announced, but we are still a very long way away from that. So there's a whole discussion going on about how do we make intellectual property? Uh, and, and of course, Moses will be very interested in this. Uh, how do we make that uh, safe, but that people can use it? Now, IP currently for the vaccines that we are, are doing now is really not a hindrance. You will read a lot in the media that IP is hindering us developing. Please believe me, it, in the short term, it is not a problem. In the long term, it could be a problem, but currently in Africa, we have not invented any vaccines yet. Right. Uh, so, but when we do, IP becomes critically important. But also, as you know, the medicines uh, patent pool as a mechanism where these multinationals can give their patents to the MPP and then they give it out uh, under licensing to local companies. So there is a process to do that. But it is very, very critical, particularly the technology transfer. <clears throat> Excuse me. I can give you a real example. I used to work at what is GSK now in the states. And when I was there, we were doing a technology transfer of GSK vaccine from, from their vaccine facility in Belgium to a Brazilian company, which actually already makes vaccines, right? So it was a technology transfer from a vaccine producer to another vaccine producer. So you would think that would be a fairly easy because it is people both sides know what, it's, what, it, what vaccine manufacturing is about. If I told you that the whole tech transfer 
took seven years to complete. Seven years to complete. Again, it tells you it is extremely complicated. We must never forget that. And I think uh, sometimes uh, when you are sitting at top of organizations, you're a li little distant away from, from what is real. And I think a lot of our heads of state are saying, we want vaccine manufacturing, we can do it in six months. It is impossible. It can never be done in six months, right? It can never be done in six months. The fourth, uh, no, the fifth three, sorry, is research and development. Again, we've touched on it. We have a research and development, but very little in vaccine. So, so this group is talking about how do we create centers of excellence? How do we share this research? How do we share the, the IP that goes with the research? I think most of you will know that through WHO and African Union, there is now the what they call the messenger RNA hub in Cape Town, uh, which includes a lot of donor funding, WHO funding. And that hub is really the main reason for that hub is to create expertise in messenger RNA R&D, which can help then local manufacturers who want to get into mRNA vaccines. Uh, today, the Moderna and Pfizer Beyond Tech vaccines are mRNA vaccines. They are much faster to produce and in the long term cheaper to produce uh, because they don't require a live virus or a dead virus. It's all done in a lab. It's done through basically your uh, DNA analysis and then producing RNA. Uh, so, so that's going to move fast, but again, the technology, the RNA, the, the research doesn't, we haven't got enough in Africa, but certainly we will have in a few years. <clears throat> and then the last one is about infrastructure development, from how do we, uh, you know, I think it was Dennis who already talked about, you know, uh, electricity is extremely expensive in Uganda, we don't have consistent power. These are all going to be very, very critical things when it comes to vaccine manufacturing. Because uh, unlike uh, making a tablet, you know, if, you, if electricity runs out, you can stop a batch and then later on, half an hour later, you can start it again. In vaccines, you can't do that. It's continuous production. It is sterile production. So it, it makes it usually complex. So those are the six streams that, that are going on with Pavam. Last week in Kigali, uh, after six months of, of Pavam's functioning, this was presented to all the sort of a lot of heads of state for president at the meeting. It was obviously a, a hybrid meeting, most people are virtual. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and each of the streams basically talked about where they are with it. Okay. And, and I think that the biggest challenge is, and then something that we, we have to keep in mind is prior to the pandemic, the actual vaccine manufacturing space in the world, global, was actually declining. A lot of companies were stopping producing vaccines. Why? Because it's really a volume game. To, to, to make money, to be sustainable, you've got to produce a huge number of doses. And today the world's largest producer is the Serum Institute of India. They produce billions of doses of vaccines. And because they are producing so big, they have a very efficient manufacturing uh, from producing antigens to actually uh, filling the vials and, 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 and syringes. So a lot of companies, including European companies, just couldn't compete with them. So companies were dropping out of the vaccine space. Now, suddenly the pandemic uh, has brought to the fore that we need more vaccine manufacturing suddenly, particularly at the moment on the fill and finish, right? Which I told you is the cost is more than double of a normal facility for manufacturing uh, uh, normal medicine. So, so again, it's very difficult. Uh, I've talked about the know-how. It's, 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 it's extremely difficult uh, to, to get the, the, the technology. And that technology comes with a price because no multinational is just gonna say, here, Uganda, give, here's that technology, make vaccines. It just doesn't happen like that. They would have to move a whole of people here. They would have to train our people, which would take a number of years, and then they would leave, but then somebody has to take over the plant. And, and, and in all this, the, the thing that is sometimes not talked about, particularly at a very senior uh, political level, is who is going to pay for this vaccine, right? Because nobody's going to put a facility for a couple of hundred million dollars if they can't make it sustainable. Sustainability can only come if you're actually making a profit. Even if it's not a big profit, you've got to make a profit, otherwise you're not going to be sustainable. It's very simple. So... Currently, vaccines for 
the, the poorer countries like Southern African countries are almost all bought through this Gavi pool procurement uh, mechanism. Uh, I won't I want to go into in detail, but basically Gavi uh, forecasts uh, and works with our governments, gets a forecast of the vaccines that are needed, and then buys, uh, you know, as one lot uh, from the Serum Institute or from other, some of the other companies, from Varas, from Sanofi, from Pfizer, and they get an extremely good price. And then they get that, give that to our governments, uh, and the, so the governments are paying a very, very low price for vaccines today. Now, if a Ugandan company said Ugandan company, a higher price, because for sure, making vaccines locally, our prices, at least for the first five, six, seven years, will be significantly higher than the Serum Institute of India, because they are making billions. We will be making, if we are lucky, a million, a couple of million, right? Uh, so, so that's one issue. The second issue is that it is extremely, extremely critical that we think big. We think of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa is a market, East Africa is a market, not Uganda, not Kenya, because no vaccine facility can be sustainable if they're only making one or two vaccines for one or two countries, which is just not possible. Because actually the number of doses of vaccines are not the same as the number of tablets of paracetamol. The number of tablets of paracetamol is much bigger. In fact, when I was uh, running KPI, we were making, every month we were making 40 to 50 million tablets of Camadon, which was KPI paracetamol. You're not going to be doing that in vaccines. So that's the other issue. Can we get our politicians to accept that, look, yes, let's have a vaccine manufacturing in Uganda, but it will make these five vaccines. Maybe we can afford one in Rwanda, because that's already going ahead, I think, as you all know. They will make the mRNA BioNTech vaccine. Because there is no way that you can make two countries adjacent to each other can make the same vaccine. One of, one of them will become what they call a white elephant. And this is a lot being discussed in the pattern because, because of the excitement, everybody wants a facility, but it, it doesn't make sense. You know, you will end up with plants that are sitting there and somebody has lost a lot of money, right? So, so that's something else we need to talk about. And then finally, you know, if we were to, if we were to, uh, if we were to implement everything that Pavam is saying, which is all these streams, including, by the way, I haven't touched on it, but training of people is one of the most critical part of successful vaccine manufacturing. Again, it is, you know, you can't just take a, a CIPLA QCI machine operator to operate vaccines. It is completely different. So we have to spend a lot of uh, time, both in our universities and our academics, to change the curriculum so that they can teach uh, vaccinology, basically. Uh, currently, I think in Africa, there are no schools that teach vaccinology. There's one in Italy, in Siena, where a lot of people are said to learn about manufacturing vaccines, but we will need those vaccine schools in, in Africa if we're going to be successful. Uh, and finally, I think, uh, you know, the, we've set a fantastically ambitious goal of 60%. I don't think we'll get there, but even if we go halfway there, it will be a massive, massive uh, achievement for Africa because it's driven by Africa for Africans, which is really what we need to do. But there are a number of big buts. I think we need a huge political commitment, not just to say that, yes, we are going to support vaccines, but to say that we can work together, to accept that we can't, all of, all of us cannot have vaccines, right? And that is, of course, something politically which is being discussed at the African Union level, fully that, that is being asked for. Is $30 billion for the next 20 years. To achieve everything, $30 billion. Of the $30 billion, $20 billion will go into what they call R&D, okay, which is setting up the basis for us to build a facility. Because you, know, you can easily go to Germany and get a German company to come and build a plant, but that's only a beginning of it. You know, how are we going to run the plant and all that kind of thing. And these days, as you know, there are these modular plants where you basically build it like in a, in, a, in, a, in a container in, in, in uh, Belgium or in France, and you just bring it and you put it in the manway and you plug it in and it works. So that, that part of vaccine development has become very effective and very efficient, but who's gonna run it? Uh, is our drug authority at a level where they can, manu uh, they can uh, uh, monitor vaccines? All that is still to be done. 
So imagine they're asking for what essentially is close to the GDP of Uganda, $30 billion. Nobody has yet talked about where that's going to come from. You know, is Uganda going to contribute? Is Kenya going to contribute? Of course, we'll have some donors contributing as well. So, so to me, we have a huge opportunity. It is fantastic to see that the African Union has taken it on board. So it is driven by our heads of state. They've approved it. Uh, and now we need to, so, so this Pavan plan, they've, they've developed what they call a framework for action, FFA. It is now in its, in its final draft stage. It will be presented to our heads of state in February. And then I'm sure it will be approved. And then we have to see how we implement it, what role each organization has. So I would like to leave it there. I would say it's a superb opportunity for us, but I wouldn't want any of you to leave this place thinking it is, it is not easy. I know we have announced that we are doing a vaccine uh, facility in Uganda. Unless we have a partner, it's a lot of scientists that are, uh, you know, have got the right education in terms of vaccinology, a uh, lot of R&D. Uh, so, so no, but it's an exciting time. It's an exciting time, and I think uh, uh, we should wholeheartedly support that. So, and I will leave it here, and we'll be very happy to, to obviously uh, take on any questions. I would like to finish by one thing that I know that Dr. Neville said, which I so wholeheartedly agree. I think we should never forget in this time how hard our healthcare workers and our frontline workers have worked. And we know that many, many of them have lost their lives all over the world, not just in Uganda. And I think we should always think about them and, and, and thank them for, for the work they've done. So I'd like to leave that note and, and thank you so much for inviting me to this panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Nazim, for sharing all um, at regional level the opportunities that we have. Um, I think that's been very uh, informative. Um, we uh, run out, uh, uh, out of our time, but we have our last uh, uh, panelist before we, we uh, go into the brief plenary session. We apologize uh, for running uh, over time. Um, we'll have the last uh, panelist who is uh, an other than Miss Alice Kayongo. So we've had uh, a discussion around policy opportunities. We've had uh, uh, a discussion on the potential uh, complexities around local production uh, by Dr. Dennis, and we've had that regional perspective and the opportunities that have been shared uh, for vaccine manufacturing in sub-Saharan Africa. We will now go uh, to our last panelist to just share with us the emerging issues on access to vaccines and this to bring the civil society perspectives as civil society, what should we uh, uh, be doing around uh, advocacy? What are those emerging issues that we should be keen? Uh, again, from Alice, who is a, a senior policy advisor at the, Afri uh, at the Wachi Health um, which is an African regional organization. She is a member of the Civil Society Campaigns for Justice and Better Well Being. She uh, also has been part of many successful networks of civil society, including the regional networks for uh, such as Africa Free for uh, Free of New HIV uh, Infections. And she's also a member of the Access to uh, Medicine Coalition that is uh, hosted by HEPS. Uh, she has her, she's passionate about issues that affect people, especially the most vulnerable. We welcome you, Alice, to uh, wrap up our panel discussion and give us that, uh, the emerging issues that you have picked out. Welcome, Alice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. And many thanks to Sehad for organizing this very important meeting that is actually extremely relevant, especially given the times that we all live in today. But first, Anne, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. There's just a bit of okay. background, I think, the feedback, but we can hear you. Sorry, sorry about the background noise. I'm seated in a public space. <laughs> I wish I would control it, but unfortunately, I'm unable to. I will just try to um, try to be as brief as possible. And I know that 
one of the advantages or maybe a disadvantage of speaking last is that you you stand a risk of uh, you know having a repetition, repeating all that has been said. Uh, so much has been said by um, Dr. Neville, by Moses, um, by uh, 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 Dennis, and by Nazim. Uh, uh, so much of what has been said is what I also have to say. I will just underscore some of the points that have been said. And uh, so moving on to the emerging issues that we see. There are several issues that we see, and again, um, many of these have been noted. But first is the fact that we do have, um, uh, you know, in order for us to be able to access vaccines and medicines in this part of the world, uh, including uh, several other low and middle income countries, there must be a waiver or suspension in patents. We have seen this especially in um, uh, you know, the COVID era where we see patents uh, uh, you know, being a, a barrier to access to vaccines and other uh, COVID-19 tools. And what we say as civil society is that um, you know, now is a time for us not to focus on profits, but much more on uh, human life. We know that, for example, with, with the COVID situation, if we do have um, people having COVID in one part of the world, vaccines in that part of the world, but then seeing that not many others in other parts of the world do have the same access they do not have the same level of access, then that is a problem in itself because we live in a global uh, kind of village, people moving from one place to another. And that means that there will be um, high trans, uh, transmissibility of uh, uh, you know, COVID-19. And so what we say as civil society is that um, uh, while COVID-19 vaccines are primarily funded by taxpayers, uh, not even pharmaceutical companies, we call on all vaccine manufacturers to openly share their technology and intellectual property. And for all vaccine, uh, sorry, and for the uh, governments, for the uh, local governments to ensure that COVID-19 vaccines are declared a public good. This we have seen in Uganda, we have seen in many parts of, 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 uh, of Africa, but unfortunately, you know, declaring it does not necessarily translate into the action that is desired for us to be able to see vaccines and medicines as a public good. So we just cannot look at, uh, you know, uh, past examples, such as examples with um, the AIDS epidemic and saving the world as we did with uh, antiretroviral medicines or HIV. We just can't look past them, but we need to be able to learn from such experiences. In the early 90s, uh, 2000s, we saw, you know, how uh, there were problems with accessing antiretrovirals, and we saw uh, the rise in infections in um, uh, uh, third world countries, including Uganda. We have several lessons that we need to pick from, several lessons that we need to uh, replicate and make sure that we have uh, COVID-19 vaccines, we have COVID-19 tools, but also medicines that are required in this part of, of the world. Secondly, is, um, and maybe just to, you know, talk about uh, uh, patents. We know, for example, in Uganda, that Uganda did not sign the COVID-19 patent waiver on vaccines and related medical supplies. I think Uganda abstained in the vote at the World Trade Organization in 2020. And I, I guess that was such a huge uh, you know, service to the people of Uganda. I sit down and wonder why Uganda abstained but um, maybe uh, colleagues who have done a lot of work around this area and have been following closely could be able to give us some of the, of, uh, you know, the reasons why this was done. But um, you know, speaking again about this issue, I think it's in order for us as civil society to reach out to the government, to reach out to our duty bearers, 
and ensure that such mistakes are not made again um, in countries like Uganda. The second issue that I want to talk about is on elimination of all restrictions on sharing information and data. This has already been alluded to by almost all the speakers. We know that, uh, for example, there hasn't been 100% transparency in uh, sharing of information and data. And we need it sooner than yesterday because there is no way we can be able to fight a, a, a pandemic uh, such as COVID if we do not have transparency. So we advocate for an enforceable mandate to ensure transparency and accountability for all countries and organizations when it comes to um, uh, global public health. We know that the bulk of vaccine procurements has been accomplished through closed door deals between individual governments and um, drug companies where very little information has been released in detail, um, uh, has been released including detail of agreements but we, 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 we call upon different um, manufacturers to be able to be as transparent as possible uh, so that we can see increased access to vaccines, but also to medicines. The other area that I would like to talk about, again, which has been alluded to quite extensively, is uh, the issue of international cooperation. We, uh, I mean, at some point we talked about markets, we talked about uh, uh, demand, we talked about, um, you know, being able to ha have a high level of negotiation, uh, but we can't do this if we stand out individually or independently. We have to be part of a bigger block. And that way we will be able to, uh, you know, have as much as we need and for possibly that should be able to help us. Speaking about the opportunities, I know that Moses, for example, mentioned that, you know, we have opportunities of manufacturing uh, capacities. However, we do have just a few industries in the country. But just on the other side, I want to say that, you know, we are not exactly in a bleak situation. We do have um, uh, manufacturing capacities. Yes, we have quality chemicals, we have other industries, which I think that if some of these are actually repurposed, if we have um, uh, waivers that are, are given on, uh, you know, patent waivers that are granted, if we have um, information and uh, data sharing, and maybe support or incentives given by the government to different manufacturing companies, then we'll possibly be able to have some of the uh, manufacturing com companies repurpose their, their uh, mandate to be able to get into vaccines and so on. I know that it's possibly far-fetched at this point, but there's always um, a start to something, and possibly this is the time that we can ensure that we are, are able to start up on some of these, of these areas. Um, there are several challenges that we have seen uh, in access to the COVID vaccine, but also access to medicine and other medicines and other tools. One of them which really depresses me is corruption. Many Ugandans on this forum know much about what is happening. So much still going on in the media up to the, up to date regarding corruption that has happened as a result of um, the COVID uh, pandemic and it, uh, you know the response. I'll not belabor you know so much on that, but maybe also to mention the fact that um, we have a shortage in supplies. We know that the COVAX facility was created to be able to help us and other low and middle income countries to uh, access vaccines and um, uh, to access COVID vaccines. But unfortunately, even up to date, the vaccines that are being received, while they are much deserved, the shelf life is quite short. Many of them are expiring in a period of one to two months. And what does that mean for us in a country like Uganda? Shall we be able to mobilize populations to access these vaccines within the given time, especially given the fact that we also have huge vaccine hesitancy? That is an issue that we possibly need to think about and um, find possible ways of uh, tackling. 
Speaking about hesitancy, I think one of the issues that has been, has come up or has uh, been unleashed in this era is the fact that our communication strategies are not as up to date as we may want them to be. At some point, I used to think that Uganda is possibly very good at you know communication, health communication, and so on. But the, the hesitancy that we are seeing with regard to uptake of the COVID uh, vaccines just shows us that our communication is not really good because you find that even within the elite we see a lot of hesitancy people are hesitating to take the vaccine if the elite are hesitating then what do we expect from the ordinary from the ordinary wanainchi at a grassroots level at the same point i think one of the areas that we are seeing is the fact that um uh, uh, vaccines uh, have mainly been offered at static points in facilities. But in the recent past, uh, having seen this trickle down to community level, I think is, it, it is helping. And this is an area that we need to actually encourage the ministry to be able to take on in um, uh, in uh, to take on in full swing, because we see that many communities are now being able to um, uh, it, we see an increase, generally an increased uptake because of the fact that uh, vaccines have moved closer to the communities. And uh, however, my worry at this point would be with maintenance of the uh, cold chain, because if you see, you know, queues at Bulange in Mengo or queues at Chitebi, you know, um, uh, football pitch, how best are we going to be able to maintain the cold chain for these vaccines, which uh, Dr. Neville mentioned, that we have to keep them within certain degrees, um, some of them being minus uh, degrees. But maybe if we take uh, advantage of, um, say, pharmacies at community level and other uh, maybe clinics or, or uh, yeah, basically community structures, use some community structures and community systems to be able to reach out to different um, communities. I feel that, that is something that will be, uh, that could actually help us uh, accomplish our goal. So in a nutshell, I think, uh, you know, this is what, these, these are some of the issues that we are seeing as civil society. Um, we, we, we know that we have been able to, to attract, well, not a civil society, but governments in, in Africa, specifically the South African government has been able to attract uh, Johnson & Johnson. But again, that's not an end in itself. If we see that, uh, you know, vaccines are being manufactured and then even before the South African community benefits from the vaccines, we are actually seeing them being exported to Europe then that becomes a little bit, not even a little bit, it becomes much more of disrespect for the African race. And these are some of the things that we need to stand against. These are some of the issues that we need to fight and we need to uh, ensure that such mistakes do not happen um, in the near future and uh, even beyond. Thank you so much, Anne. I'll stop here and I'll be happy to respond to questions if any. Thank you, Alice for giving us those uh, emerging issues and uh, the call from civil society, which has been clear. Um, we will go into our plenary. We don't have so many questions. We, of course, are out of time. But, uh, we have uh, about one or two questions, and then we will uh, wrap up. So thank you. Um, the question that I see in the Q&A is, uh, any of the panelists can answer to this. Uh, what opportunities lie ahead of herbal medicine production, practice, and regulation? For example, how do we deal with advertisement of herbal medicine and herbal treatment practice? Um, maybe Dennis could jump in if he's still on to that question, or Dr. Neville, or any of the panelists. The other question was, uh, is the Uganda manufacturing, pharmaceutical manufacturing report publicly available? I think also um, any of the panelists can answer to that. I don't, um, yeah, so those are the questions. The rest are comments. Only have those two questions. The rest are comments, which we can take note of. The comments about challenges of fluctuating uh, prices of essential medicines, uh, essential commodities, 
and that uh, MOH and NDA should regulate those prices. And then there's also a comment on drug abuse that is facilitated by uh, factors uh, that include failure to enforce the law. So the, the question are just those two. I will invite the, any of the panelists to respond to the question. And I could take the question on uh, the fluctuating uh, Price. medicine prices, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe to also overemphasize this. Really, uh, I think during COVID we've seen how uh, prices can be manipulated, and how consumers uh, can be taken for a ride. Uh, we saw uh, that. Uh, we saw, we saw it when uh, hospitalizations for, uh, for two weeks uh, for COVID, uh, people paid over 100 million and facilities were saying most of this is because of the medicines they were using to, to treat. And therefore, uh, you know, even though we live in a, a free market economy where demand should uh, determine supply, I think even in economics, there are goods that uh, are for a common good that usually uh, where you, you cannot subject them to forces of demand and supply. And so health and particularly medicines are one of those. Over the years, we've been trying to push for um, a, a regulatory framework around uh, control of uh, medicine prices. This will certainly be difficult given the, the appetite of also uh, pro political priorities. But what can be done for a country? We can start with the low-lying fruits. And health insurance is one of the best ways to regulate uh, prices. Because when you have a good health insurance, it has a medicines benefit list. And the insurance has a price at which it pays. So if we have health insurance rolled out across the country, that is the best way, one of the best ways we can manage prices. But also the, one of the best ways to, one of the biggest hurdles we have as a country is that when you need, when you're sick, you have to pay out of pocket and you have not kept that money. Health insurance helps you that, you know, you have a pool, the rich subsidize the poor. And you know, that will certainly ease these constraints we have on, on healthcare costs. I think you also asked me to comment on the issue around opportunities for traditional medicine. Um, I think we, we have seen that with, uh, with COVID, all of us were using some, one hub or another, either to inhale, to drink. And so that's a big opportunity for us to go back and look into how do we improve uh, these traditional and complementary medicines. Uh, good enough, we have a new act of parliament. Um, the uh, National Pharmaceutical Sector Strategic Plan is also very keen on, uh, uh, on traditional and complementary medicines. And therefore, we just need to ensure that we implement uh, this new strategy and that uh, stakeholders are brought onto the table, uh, first of all, to, um, to discuss the challenges. People have talked about advertising, um, in, you know, even irrational use. Uh, so we need to have a multi-sector discussion on this. Uh, we need to ensure that funds are put aside to implement the National Pharmaceutical Sector Strategic Plan. Uh, and maybe uh, also the commissioner had, uh, is still here. Uh, I don't know if the commissioner is still here, but she could comment, but that's how I think we can address this area. Thank you and back to you. Um, thank you, Dennis. Um, I think you've addressed both um, both uh, questions. I don't see uh, the commissioner online. Probably she's dropped off. Um, I just want to to give the panelists just one, uh, a minute each to just uh, wrap up uh, any uh, any uh, uh, thing that you that you need to wrap up, and then we will close. Anne, could I go first? Yes, Anne.
thank you so much. And um, maybe just even before I get to my wrap up, one of the issues that Dr. Dennis has, uh, you know, mentioned with regard to pricing, I, I, I think the Ministry of Health has fallen short of, uh, you know, being able to monitor and regulate the prices that are being charged at different facility level. Because if you find one private facility, facility charging over 100 million for one COVID case, and then you find another charging maybe 20 million, the difference is just so huge. I'm not sure which unit at the ministry should be able to, um, to really look into that, but that is an area that we definitely need to talk about. And I do uh, acknowledge the fact that Sehad has done quite a lot of work in this area. But then when we get on to you know, herbal medicine and uh, local production, one area that I see the government of Uganda you know, getting into is supporting researchers at an individual level which may be good, but I think it also has its downside in the sense that, say for example, picking a researcher out of uh, a university setting and supporting them to conduct their research will only leave this information with one researcher. But if support is provided to an institution, then I feel that that will be much more sustainable and that we will be able to bring several other uh, you know, researchers on board. So that is a little bit of uh, you know, spreading of the benefit and maybe minimizing uh, different risks. Otherwise, what we see in the uh, national budget framework paper, for example, is that different researchers are being singled out uh, for support, financial support. Uh, for, for, for research in vaccines, in medicines, and so on, which in my view, I, I mean, it could be good in one way, but it may be a disservice to us in, in another way. So I'll end here for now, and uh, maybe just to wrap up by saying that uh, there's so much to be done, and uh, we can only do this uh, if we work in partnership with uh, several stakeholders, at community level, at a district level, at national level, but also at regional level. And one area that I must really uh, uh, emphasize too is uh, an issue to do with health worker remuneration. We all know what is going on now with the intern doctors, but we know the amount of work that they do in this country, but also the work that they have particularly done during the COVID um, uh, uh, era in this country. So that is an area that we also need to talk about as civil society. But, um, and I know that we can't do that alone. We need to uh, work with several others, including the Health, work, health, work, um, Associ health Workers Association itself and uh, you know, different stakeholders. So thank you so much and over to you, Anne. Thank you, Anne. Uh, recommendations and your comments are taken out of. Um, in case there is no other panelists that wish to uh, uh, summarize or give a comment that they had not given, uh, we will go. Uh, we'll close. Uh, we'll just uh, to summarize from our discussion what we uh, picked out. Um, what has been clear as a call is to reduce the over reliance on importation um, of vaccines and medicines, and that. Uh, there have been recommendations, several recommendations throughout the, from the keynote to all the panelists, and one of them uh, was to have a make uh, access to affordable financing um, uh, to in increase or improve on access to affordable financing. And then also there was a recommendation that we need a comprehensive assessment on the market uh, to be clear on what medicines and products we should import and what we should not import and then also uh, we should take advantage of the regional mobilization and the regional market uh, we should streamline the incentives given to manufacturers government should streamline incentives given to manufacturers and also we should uh, uh, strengthen that to the pharmaceutical association to strengthen membership 
uh, so that it's more competitive. We should also address issues, uh, underlying issues that make production, local production uh, more expensive, such as uh, making electricity more affordable and reliable. Uh, also, for uh, there should be accountability and feedback from the regional level representation, uh, uh, especially the um, African COVID vaccine task force and, and, and so forth. And also, uh, there's a recommendation to train people on vaccine production. Uh, we must also have waivers on uh, patents. Uh, vaccine ma manufacturers should be able to share uh, their knowledge. There should be an uh, they should eliminate uh, restriction on sharing of data. There should be transparency and accountability for all the countries um, that are manufacturing and holding on to these vaccines. And then also to improve on our communication strategy as a country uh, to address the vaccine hesitancy and that there should be a vaccine equity for what is manufactured in Africa should yeah, Africans should be able to benefit from that. So that's, those are the things that we picked up from uh, the discussions, from our panelists, from the comments. Thank you again, for everyone, for making the time to participate in this meeting. It has been very uh, productive discussion. Again, uh, we really appreciate our panelists for making the time during this uh, festive season where everyone is closing office, for making the time to prepare and to share with us uh, uh, from uh, what you have shared today. And for the participants who have uh, veered on and stayed on, uh, on the call past the time, we thank you for your patience and for your valuable participation and comments that have come in. Thank you and we wish you a good afternoon and Merry Christmas to all of you. Thanks, Anne, and thanks, Sehad.